teach the kids it all started with the Big Bang 20 billion years ago. What exploded? <laughs> this is what the textbooks teach. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing, literally nothing, an infinitesimal nugget of space. And then something happened, triggering the most colossal explosion in history. Yes, boys and girls, you see, nothing exploded, and uh, here we are. So I asked this professor if I could ask him some questions about the Big Bang. I said, where did all this matter come from? He said, well, we don't know that for sure. I said, well, sir, would you please tell me where the laws came from? The universe is run by laws, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia. Who gave the laws? He said, we don't know that either. I said, sir, could you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make a Big Bang. Who bought the gas to run this machine anyway? Hmm? He said, we don't know that either. Okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe God created the heaven and the earth, like the Bible teaches, you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. But you said, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that either. We don't Don't know tell me either. my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, sir, they're both religious. Evolution is a religion. You have to believe. So I asked the professor, where did the matter come from? He said, I don't know. So basically, I believe in the beginning God, and you believe in the beginning dirt. One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. He said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. He said, you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> And they're going to tell the kids, well, we have evidence for this theory. Charlie Darwin stopped off at these islands right there called the Galapagos Islands. Charlie studied the birds very carefully and said, you know what? I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. You see 14 kinds of birds and you conclude that birds and bananas are related. See, what's happened, these guys have looked for missing links in the, in the fossil record. They can't find any. And so they say, well, maybe evolution happened so fast it wasn't preserved. Maybe a reptile laid an egg and a bird hatched out. Well, who did that bird marry? Hmm? I'm going to tell the kids in the late 1940s, they invented carbon dating. We're going to explain a little bit about radiometric dating and how it's supposed to work, and then show you that it does not work, okay? It sounds good, but there are some assumptions that mess everything up. If we had walked into a room and found a candle burning on the table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know, Mr. Hovind, it's burning when I got here. Okay, well then, let's do some empirical science. Let's measure the height of the candle. Suppose the candle is seven inches tall. Who can tell me when it was lit? Okay, nobody. Let's do some more empirical science. Let's measure the rate of burn. Suppose we determine it's burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You're going to have a hard time telling me unless you're willing to make some assumptions. You find a fossil in the dirt. You can measure how much C14 is in it. Very accurately, by the way. And you can measure how fast it's decaying. That's just like measuring the height of your candle and how fast it's burning. Now, when did that animal die? You don't have a clue. Here's what you ought to consider about carbon dating. Samples of known age, it doesn't work. If it's a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. <laughs> These are, it's just really hard thing. It's, it's really a hard thing. Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. Living penguins, carbon dated 8,000 years old. One part of Dima was 40,000 years old, another part was 26,000, and the wood next to it is 9,000. Then they tell the kids about the geologic column. They say each of the layers is a different age, you know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all them Zoic boys. Now, if you get a petrified tree standing up, running through different rock layers, I don't think it's smart to say those layers are vastly different ages. Those trees did not get slowly covered by the sediments over millions of years. They would rot and fall down. Uh, crazy. I just, uh, now, see, boys and girls, you have an appendix that you don't need anymore. That's a vestigial structure. That's proof of evolution. Well, excuse me, you do need your appendix. The appendix is part of your immune system. If your appendix is taken out, you can still live, okay, but it increases your susceptibility to quite a few diseases. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes also. That doesn't prove you don't need them. There are no vestigial organs, and even if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. I was taught when I went to school, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it.
I thought, didn't need it. Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? Have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? Wouldn't that be nice, man, be able to grab that door and walk right around and get in? <laughs> Lost it because we didn't need it. Man, you could drive the car and tune the radio knob and hold a Coke at the same time. Why is there still monkeys? Natural selection doesn't cause any evolution. It makes sure the bad ones don't survive, but it's not going to change it to something else. That's what evolution is. If you worked in a factory that produced cars and your job was to check for defects and you caught every single mistake and you rejected it, how long would it take that process to change the car to an airplane? You say it'll never change it. That's my point. The students are taught we have evidence from development. Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of evidence. This textbook says, the human embryo growing in the mother has gills like a fish. Those little folds of skin are not gills. Those little wrinkles under your chin when you're growing up later develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen folks that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. Those are not gill slits. Ernst Haeckel, though, said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book. He made huge charts of his posters of his drawings of these embryos and traveled all over Germany and just about by himself converted the Germans to believing in evolution. Haeckel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and he changed them to make them look exactly alike. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings, underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Now either he's a lousy artist or he's a liar. Well, it turns out he's a liar. He was convicted of fraud by his own university, proven to be a fraud. But guess what? Haeckel's fake drawings are still used in textbooks in your state right now. It's only been proven wrong 125 years ago. I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but that ought to be plenty of time. Adolf Hitler said, you let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. You let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. It's